The Democracy Forum is a not-for-profit organization founded in 2009 under the patronage of Baroness Nicholson of Winterbourne. Its principal goal was to work for the furtherance of democracy, peace and the rule of law in order to counter religious fundamentalism and intolerance in our global communities. In an increasingly fractured world, this goal continues to be the driving force behind all of the Forum's activities. Lord Charles Bruce is the current president of the Forum. Since its inception, the Forum has hosted and co-hosted seminars on a wide variety of topics relating to democracy and human rights across the world. The Democracy Forum encourages academics, students, journalists and other socially and politically conscious people to attend our seminars and to participate in the question and answer session. Details are available on our website, thedemocracyforumlimited.com. The Democracy Forum brings you another not-to-be-missed webinar. China's battle for influence in South and Southeast Asia, can it succeed? As China's economic and political footprints continue to extend across the world, South and Southeast Asia are two areas of particular strategic interest. What is China's rationale for engaging with South and Southeast Asia? How have regional governments responded to Chinese engagements, and what drives their responses? What can they learn from their experiences of closer ties with China, and are certain nations more vulnerable than others to Beijing's influence? And what diplomatic steps can other major world powers take that might counteract some of China's sway in the region? To discuss these and other crucial issues, please join our panelists at the Democracy Forum's next live debate, bringing your questions, comments and challenges for the panel. Hello, welcome everyone, wherever you are in the world. I'm Humphrey Hawksley, your host for this most timely Democracy Forum debate, because it is 50 years to the month since President Richard Nixon visited China in a step to winning the Cold War and attempting to usher China into what is now described as the international rules-based global order. But a little known aside came from Henry Kissinger, who set up the visit, some years later, he emerged from a tough meeting with Chinese officials and said to one of his aides, when these people don't need us anymore, they are going to be very difficult to deal with. How true many in Washington and Europe are finding that now. Today, that authoritarian bond between Moscow and Beijing appears to be strengthening day on day. The goal is to weaken America and its allies. Russia tests its resolve in Ukraine, China, in Taiwan, and the tentacles of influence are everywhere. Beijing sees Asia as its own backyard, and we're going to look specifically at South and Southeast Asia, 19 countries, none a fully developed democracy, very rich pickings for China. What is its battle for influence there, and can it succeed? And we're looking at this issue today specifically from the viewpoint of America and Europe, with experts who have spent a lifetime working and studying in Asia. We have a superb panel, Sheena Gratins, Patrick Cronin, Derek Rand, Felix Hajduk, Michael Reiterer, Robert Sutter. And summing up will be Democracy Forum's chair, Barry Gardner, MP, vastly experienced through his political career in this region and its issues. Usually with our debates, I hand over to the Democracy Forum President, Lord Charles Bruce, to lay out the canvas of our discussion. But Charles has gone down with COVID. We wish him a speedy recovery. And if he's tuning in, we will, of course, take on board his questions and comments, as with all our audience. Please challenge and do question us. We're going to begin with Sheena Gratins, Associate Professor of the University of Texas, visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C. Sheena will enlighten us on China's economic engagement, together with its general collaboration in police training, law enforcement throughout the region, and such like. Sheena, the screen is yours. 
Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be part of this forum today and uh, especially to be on the virtual stage with uh, some distinguished colleagues whose opinions I'm very much looking forward to hearing today. Um, I want to spend a bit less time on the first point, as I know some of my colleagues are going to talk a bit more about trade and the economic agenda in depth and spend a bit more time on the second point about law enforcement. Um, but just before I, I do, I'll briefly take a moment to set the scene in terms of um, economic uh, sort of relative weight um, between the United States and China in particular, and um, what we know from survey data and conversations in the region on the way um, that China's activities are perceived. It's very clear that China is a center of economic gravity in the region. 73%, around 70% of, depending on which survey you look at, um, of uh, respondents in the region view China as economically dominant. Um, but uh, that's not always accompanied by high political trust. And in particular, we've seen some trust in China's current and future behavior weaken over the course of both the sort of tensions in the South China Sea and over the course of the last two years, um, China's handling of the, the global pandemic. Um, but there's no doubt that China's extraordinarily high level of trade and economic engagement, which the opening video really highlighted, um, give it a center of gravity and a scale of influence in the region um, that that uh, that are just something that that I think we all have to accept as a current geoeconomic reality. Um, at the same time, however, we've seen even over the course of the past year that public opinion in the region has shifted to view the United States somewhat more positively than uh, than it has sometimes been viewed in the past, and in particular, trust in the United States current and future behavior has has increased. Um, I'll also add here that one of the United States' closest allies in the region, Japan, has very, very high levels of trust across the region and a very high level of economic engagement as well, which is something I think we sometimes um, don't think about or talk about as much when we're thinking about regional dynamics. Um, I think it'd be a mistake to view this solely as a US-China sort of conversation rather than um, uh, you know, also thinking about uh, Japan's role. Um, but, you know, that support is uneven. Um, countries like Laos and Brunei are more oriented toward China, while the Philippines and Vietnam tend to be more pro-U.S. in their sentiment, um, and that's been consistent over time. Um, just a moment, I'm sorry, I've got, um, uh, my son has just come in, I'll be right That's, uh, Sheena has got to go off for more important things than this, but very interesting, actually. I just struck the, 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 the uh, Brunei you were mentioning. We carry on, Sheena. Yes. I, I uh, apologize. I had to reorient my preschooler this morning. Um, so, so I just wanted to note that, um, you know, the, the sort of geography of public opinion across the, the region is um, both somewhat uneven uh, across different countries um, and, uh, and also and, you know, changing a bit over time in the last several years. Um, but it's also important that, you know, the, um, the region has typically, um, because I think of this perception of China as economically dominant, um, you know, look to the United States for certain forms of security assistance, but also recognizing China's continued economic gravity um, is reluctant to be forced into a position where it might have to choose. And so I think we've seen some recent rhetoric out of Washington maybe trying to acknowledge that reality. We can talk a bit more in the discussion about whether or not that the, the framing has been effective. Um, I have a, a few concerns about how the, the, the democracy agenda has been presented and, and whether there's a way to communicate that more effectively in a region like Southeast Asia. Um, but let me turn for a moment to something that I think is a really important, but actually largely overlooked area of Chinese activity and influence. Um, that's been quite important in some of the rhetoric of the party state itself, and I think is, is important in the region, but not something that we commonly talk about because it's, it's simply not often sort of thought of um, in, uh, in foreign policy terms. And that is China's growing use of uh, law enforcement diplomacy and international law enforcement activity to build relationships, partnerships, and influence in the region. Xi Jinping about four years ago started talking about a global vision for national security work and urging the political legal apparatus, Chinese court system, Ministry of Public Security, and the whole system that does policing and domestic security in China 
to engage in and redesign, rethink its approach to international cooperation on law enforcement issues. And so we've seen a whole series of uh, speeches from senior political legal system officials um, and uh, senior police officials who've talked about uh, taking a more active and new approach to China's uh, international law enforcement activity. That includes the use of international organizations, which I think is probably a, an effective uh, sort of approach, at least at a very high abstract level, a, an effective approach in a region that uh, that is inclined toward multilateralism. And um, so I think in, in that sense, China's emphasis on the UN and on multilateralism in its law enforcement activity is well suited to Southeast Asia. But China is also providing some fairly concrete support by the way of police training um, through provincial academies and uh, international law enforcement conferences that are specific to the region, various regional fora, including a few that it has started itself, as well as the use of existing uh, fora. And it talks about uh, sharing the experience of building a safe China, which is one of the buzzwords of China's own internal security apparatus. Um, one of the phrases that signals a sharing of, of China's approach, not necessarily an imposition of it, but certainly a willingness to supply lessons learned, tools and techniques that China has found effective in building its own internal security system, which has been completely overhauled and, and, um, and rethought under Xi Jinping. And it's very clear that that's an experience that Chinese uh, public security and policing officials are now willing to share using these regional fora. Um, it's important to note that at least some of this engagement is subnational, both on the Chinese side and on the Southeast Asian side. So again, this is not something where we tend to see the Ministry of Foreign Affairs involved um, or senior diplomats. It's sometimes provincial level or Ministry of Public Security vice ministers engaging again with regional mayoral sort of city level or, or regional um, subnational regional um, officials in uh, in uh, various Southeast Asian countries. And so um, one of the reasons why I think we tend to overlook this diplomacy sometimes is it's not done by traditional actors first. And second, um, it's often done at a, at a subnational level that again, just makes it a little bit less visible to us. But the scale of this activity has been pretty important. My sense is that on the Chinese side, it's driven by two priorities. One is, is um, China's focus on counterterrorism and on trying to get a handle on um, the global presence of the Uyghur diaspora. In that sense, China's um, police cooperation can be quite repressive and aimed at extraditing people that um, the PRC views as a, as a threat, um, inconsistent with the massive levels of repression and crackdown um, that the CCP has organized in Xinjiang to date. Um, and then second priority that I think is driving a lot of this is, is China's own anti-terror, I'm sorry, anti-corruption campaign. Um, we've seen the use of global law enforcement tools and police cooperation as a major issue in trying to um, uh, make sure that fugitives are not uh, who are being pursued for for corruption are not allowed to escape. And the phrase that's used um, by public security officials is um, overseas is not extrajudicial and escape is not a way out. So we've really seen this sense that if you are you know pursued or wanted by china's internal security forces just physically leaving the prc is no it's it's no longer acceptable to the prc that that's actually a, a viable escape route and that i think poses real challenges for the the international community to think through which is a point we can come back to in a moment um the last point i wanted to make about um china's you know use of of law enforcement and police activity police diplomacy in the region is that this this activity often takes place side by side with the ex with either the provision of police assistance or in particular, the export by often private or semi-private Chinese tech companies of surveillance technology that's used in public security. Um, and a project I previously did, I tracked um, where China had provided security platforms that were specifically for use by police and internal security services. Um, again, sometimes at the national level, but sometimes at the city or the provincial level. Um, and, uh, you know, a high number of countries in, in Southeast Asia had received these you know, Huawei safe city type platforms or something comparable from another Chinese tech company. 
Um, and actually, these tech fairs are often held side by side with the law enforcement forums where China is, uh, you know, sharing its experience of building a safe China, to use the CCP's language. Um, so I think this is a case where we're not necessarily seeing China impose a coherent model. Even the, the CCP's own experience of, of building Chinese authoritarianism, authoritarianism inside China itself um, required and a sort of developed a culture of really adapting to local conditions. So I would, wouldn't ever really expect to see the CCP imposing a single model um, of you know, Chinese style Marxist Leninist authoritarianism. But what we definitely do see is a willingness to uh, supply some of the tools, the technology, the techniques, and then the lessons. So both the hardware and the software that could then be used depending on the conditions and the leadership in, in the recipient countries could then be used to make a more capable authoritarian state. Now, a lot of that depends on, on the interests um, and decisions of the players on um, on the recipient side, but it's important to note that if we think about you know exporting non-democracy or exporting authoritarianism simply as a matter of supply, that it's pretty clear that that supply is readily occurring um, uh, from the, the Chinese side. Um, I'll stop there. I think I, I, I appreciate the chance to just get this, what I think is a really important and overlooked trend in the region um, into the discussion and really look forward to what my colleagues have to say. Thank you so much. Uh, Sheena, thank you for that. That, that is incredibly interesting. Um, it, 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 I've got two, two, two things to question. Is, is that where is this happening most? I mean, you mentioned, uh, you know, you know, Brunei and Laos had a different relationship, say, to Singapore, say, to others. So where is China mostly doing this? Which countries? It's been a pretty pretty broad swath, um, and to be honest, it's more. There's been more of a focus on major cities. Um, so the variation is in some ways more subnational than it is in, uh, necessarily of particular countries. What we've seen is that um, Chinese technology companies have been fairly effective at marketing. Um, it's just that the products have been a bit different in different countries. So and the, the timing has has shifted a bit. So. Um, there are sort of important research um, partnerships and the areas that are that have active police cooperation or police training, for example, um, some you know maritime law enforcement cooperation along uh, the Mekong River Delta and and some areas in in that part of of Southeast Asia. That's an area where you see more actual joint policing activity, patrolling, training, etc. Um, whereas there are other places. Um, for example, in the Philippines, there was a huge domestic debate over um, the use of a safe city platform supplied by, by Huawei and some other Chinese tech companies. And um, what was important about that is that it, it, it's one of the few places where the terms of the agreement and how the data might be used really emerged into sort of public debate. The legislature got involved. There was discussion about the contracting. Um, so there's just, a, again, you know, Southeast Asia is a really heterogeneous region um, and Chinese activity is sort of equally heterogeneous, I think, in yeah. keeping with the, the needs of these different um, different countries. Um, so, yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 and how does that differ to in, in the sort of broad view of this into what we in the West do in similar situations. Because the first thing we do is we go in and we say we're building up the police force, the security force, we're training the judiciary, all that kind of stuff. What is the difference? Yeah, that's a great that's a great and really important question. Obviously, the, there are other countries that have tech companies supplying surveillance technology. Um, Make, I'll make no bones about that. That's very, it's very clear that that's occurring. I hope someone does a project to map some of that so we can actually make some good comparisons between Chinese activity and the and what other countries' tech companies are doing. It took me about two years just to get the data on Chinese activity. Um, and I hope someone does a sort of a, a corresponding project. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, there are a couple of, of differences. Typically now when the United Nations and, um, you know, the United States, other Western countries provide security sector reform and training, there's an explicit human rights component. There's respect for the rule of law in some of the training. And the overall context is, um, is often one in which um, those police forces are accountable to bodies um, that are democratically elected or, or democratically overseen. So there's a very different oversight mechanism 
And what we've seen is just that China is, is willing to supply these tools, whether oversight mechanisms exist or not. And, um, and so the potential is there for them to be much more corrosive to democracy and particularly to civil liberties. Right, but but uh, corrosive to our style of democracy, but favourable to, to to the system that they want to put in. Because it, and, and before I know you, if anybody wants to ask Sheena a direct question, she has to leave at three o'clock our time. So punch it in and I'll feed it in. But Philip Bowman, can I put this to you, uh, Sheena? Can Southeast Asia be seen as the gateway to future Chinese expansion? Building on your point a bit. Well, I think it depends on what type of expansion. Um, I, I think China right now, at least when we look at, you know, I spend a lot of time reading um, documents, speeches, and sort of communication um, from the senior party leadership, trying to figure out how they think about national security and what I think is really the driving force of their approach to the world, which is the desire for regime security. China defines national security as sort of centered on political security, and it defines political security as the CCP of the so the security of the socialist system, the CCP leadership, and Xi Jinping at the core. So it really fundamentally is about the regime's sort of secure hold on on power. Um, and I think you know, quite frankly, there are things a bit closer to home that that are going to be priorities for for a, a long time still. Um, you know, I think China has. Um, focused an incredible amount with tragic consequences on both Xinjiang and Hong Kong as peripheral areas where it doesn't feel that it had sufficient political control and, and security of CCP rule. Um, Taiwan is obviously a big remaining area that the CCP views as sovereign internal territory, but that is contested. Um, so, so in terms of actual sort of focus on political control and exerting China's sort of own political stamp, I think you'll see continued focus on the immediate periphery. But obviously, I think, you know, China's economic influence and its political influence um, go far, far beyond that and are now no longer a regional issue, but a truly global issue, which is I was delighted to, to have this you know conversation um, with counterparts and friends in the UK and Europe, because China is a global actor now. And there is no area from the United States standpoint um, really no area of American foreign policy where China is now not a, a factor. So in that sense, I think, it, you know, the expansion of, of influences has already occurred and will likely continue to expand. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheena, for, for that. Please stay with us as long as you can before you have to ha, have, have to have to vanish. Our next panelist is, is Patrick Cronin, uh, the Asia Pacific Security Chair at the Hudson Institute in Washington, D.C., with a very long career of working in the Indo-Pacific region. Patrick is going to explain to us the Biden administration's evolving strategy for the region, where it's working, where it's not working so well. And of course, as I was talking to him shortly before we, we, we came on air, how that differs from the previous administration or administrations and how South Asia and Southeast Asia should work with these ever-changing policies that it comes across with the electoral cycles. Patrick Cronin, give us your insights, please. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Humphrey. I've written a, a lengthy essay that will be published in the Straits Times of Singapore that deals with both the uh, promise of the strategy as well as some of the pitfalls. I really want to just focus more on uh, what the strategy uh, says, especially as it relates to this important subject uh, about uh, the struggle for influence in South and Southeast Asia. Um, it seems to me the first point to make on this program is, is that the Biden administration's new Indo-Pacific strategy, which was released and is available online um, as of last Friday, is uh, very much focused on a battle for influence in the Indo-Pacific, in all corners of the Indo-Pacific, as it puts it, because the Indo-Pacific uh, is really where they're feeling the brunt of Chinese influence and coercion, uh, pressure, but also competition. Um, and even though China is working very much globally, uh, as Sheena rightly points out, and, and Xi Jinping's vision uh, is undoubtedly a global vision. In fact, I was having a discussion with Wang Jiaxi, the famous American specialist, uh, last week, and he made it very clear that uh, from Xi Jinping's perspective, um, it's Africa is the future of China. Latin America is the future of China. Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia, South Asia, uh, it really goes on and on. Um, and it's really only these sort of Western democracies and Japan and a few other countries 
that are really standing in the way of this sort of China dream from uh, Wang Jiaxi's description of Xi Jinping's strategy. I know it's not quite that simple, but but in general terms, this really is a, a global struggle, and yet it is feeling um, more intense uh, around the periphery of China, and that's why South and Southeast Asia uh, really do feel uh, sort of the, the brunt of this, whether it's uh, along the line of actual control and conflict with India, or whether it's the gray zone activities in the South China Sea and the pushing of the nine dash line uh, sort of contest for a competition. Um, you know, those two sub regions of the Indo Pacific uh, are at the center of the competition. So the Biden administration's new strategy, which I think has a great deal of continuity from not just the uh, Obama, from the Trump administration, but also from the Obama administration before that. I, in fact, I, I call this strategy uh, sort of the uh, the son of uh, the pivot, of Obama's pivot to Asia, and maybe the daughter of Trump's free and open Indo-Pacific, because it combines elements uh, of both of them uh, in terms of trying to push peace, prosperity, and pluralism. Um, it is uh, clear, though, um, and this was interesting in, in terms of this uh, Biden administration strategy, it's clear that it poses uh, that China poses the main challenge to harmony in the Indo-Pacific. It's and so the strategy is is quite direct as one very robust paragraph in this rather concise strategic document that talks about China pursuing a sphere of influence, but also wanting to become the world's most influential power. Um, and so the strategy of pushing back on this though doesn't focus just on sort of things against China, but it focuses much more, as has been the want of, of President Biden, to, to create a positive agenda. Um, and you see that in things like the quadrilateral security dialogue among India, Japan, Australia, and the United States, which is which is largely focused on a positive agenda, whether it's vaccine delivery or whether it's supply chain security or high quality infrastructure. It, it's at least trying to um, talk about what those countries, those democracies are for, not what they're against. And yet, nonetheless, um, China is a persistent uh, competitor, challenge, rival. There's an ideological element as well as a technological, economic, political, and military element to this competition. Um, President Biden yesterday, talking about Russia and Ukraine, um, but applicable to China, said, if we do not stand for freedom, where it is at risk today, we will surely pay a steeper price tomorrow. Now, that's one of these sort of open-ended American commitments, potentially. But at the same time, it does speak to the combination of interests and values of uh, in South and Southeast Asia, the United States wanting to um, have a realistic, pragmatic approach to a region where democracy is not that strong in many countries, especially in Southeast Asia. Um, and that's putting it mildly. There's been a lot of backtracking, in fact, in uh, among a number of Southeast Asian countries but at the same time, not wanting to abandon those values and wanting to, to embrace them. I noticed that uh, China is embracing, for instance, the junta in Myanmar, um, uh, you know, and therefore uh, dismissing the democratic uh, inroads that were made in, in former Burma uh, in recent years. And that's a sign of not China exporting their model, as Sheena rightly points, they're not, they're not exporting a, a specific model, but they're quick to embrace uh, authoritarian governments. Uh, even when they're also talking with the national unity government on the side, hedging their bets, as China will do, uh, just in case uh, they end up uh, prevailing in a in what might be a protracted civil war in, in that country in Southeast Asia. Um, let me talk about the uh, influence for um, the region and, and just talk about... Um, democracy uh, in particular because of the this democracy form. Um, it, what's interesting here is that the, the Biden administration, especially the State Department under Anthony Blinken as Secretary of State, uh, have been really forthright in elevating this question of democracy and human rights. Those, those terms do not go down very well in large swaths of Asia, as I'm sure Derek uh, Grossman will, will talk about uh, next, among others. Um, but this this document, which comes out of the White House with the with the president's signature, um, actually downplays the democracy and human rights to to a considerable extent. It's much more of, of a pragmatic statement about uh, yes, it emphasizes the need for civil society, for free press, for good governments, good governance. But it's much more pragmatic. It's clear that it wants to work with Southeast Asia uh, countries on their terms uh, as they as they can work. Um, and so things like the uh, Biden administration's big summit 
uh, for democracy uh, that it held uh, in December. It was interesting to see the, the number of speakers who were there and a few who were not, including uh, some U.S. allies like Thailand were not there. But President Duterte, who's had a checkered uh, sort of record with, say, democracy and, and, and um, civil society, shall we say, um, it was very interesting to go and hear these speeches. Uh, you know, Indonesia's uh, Jokowi was much more eloquent about Indonesia's commitment, that people of Indonesia have chosen a democracy and they want to build those institutions, however fragile they remain. Um, but even Duterte had his point about, look, we, we had so many problems with inequality in the Philippines that some drastic actions had to be taken. It was, an, it was, a, it was a good defense of a very difficult position to defend in terms of some of his uh, domestic policies. Uh, obviously didn't talk about extrajudicial killings and other issues that are uh, sort of hot button issues um, in the human rights community. Um, Vietnam is an important question. Again, Derek will talk more about this, I'm sure. From a Chinese perspective, um, they would love to, to, to reduce Vietnam to this little socialist camp of Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. Um, but it's not going to be so easily reduced because Vietnam is still a growing strategic partner with the United States, with Japan, with other countries around the world. It wants this sort of uh, multidimensional policy. And so Chinese influence is going to continue to be limited because Vietnam's national interests uh, will drive it uh, internationally, not just toward China, whereas Cambodia and Laos may not have as much choice uh, as options. Cambodia is in the chair of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, this year, uh, and many people are not very uh, optimistic about whether that uh, is going to be productive multilateral uh, arena this year, whether we're talking about trying to get a code of conduct on the South China Sea, not going to happen this year either, uh, or whether it's maybe keeping um, the Myanmar junta at, at arm's length. So far, they did keep uh, Myanmar at outside of the uh, early discussions, but we'll see where this goes by the end of the year. India, though, and the embrace of India by the Biden administration, building up on the Trump administration and previous U.S. governments, uh, is, a, is, main, uh, is a main focus, really, and why we're calling it the Indo-Pacific. It's really about India as, as a beacon in South Asia and the Indian Ocean, working on this positive agenda. There are real limits, though, to this, as we saw in Melbourne this last week at the quadrilateral uh, foreign ministers meeting, the fourth one ever, um, where the uh, uh, Indian uh, external affairs minister made it clear that he didn't want to criticize Russia on Ukraine uh, and pressure on Ukraine. He really wanted to keep the agenda very positive, which is which is the lowest common denominator of what binds these four democracies in their agenda in the region. So you don't expect China to be making big in inroads with, with India. Um, you see problems that it will have in uh, Southeast Asia with big democracies like Indonesia, but even with the Philippines where they've tried to pour tens of billions of dollars or pledge tens of billions of dollars to the Philippines, most of it's not been delivered and even, even Duterte's kept China in balance. Um, and in Vietnam, the strong national interest to keep it at balance as well. So many actors in the region are wary about China, as well as uh, Russia, just as Russia and China, by the way, are very wary, some would say paranoid about potential color revolutions, the kind of democratic sparks that could threaten the legitimacy uh, of these systems. And Sheena rightly underscored the fact that CCP is very worried about protecting that political legitimacy. Their policy is an extension of that uh, protection, that survival strategy that they have. Um, let me just end by talking uh, briefly about um, some of the criticism and the wolf warrior diplomacy that, that sort of coming out that's been counterproductive in many ways for China uh, in the region. And, and polls have shown this in Southeast Asia in particular, uh, when you look at uh, the receptivity toward China has gone down uh, as it's become more belligerent, uh, both in its words and its actions. Um, the foreign ministry the spokesperson uh, speaking just uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, referred uh, derogatorily about uh, toward so-called democracy, quote unquote. Uh, he talked about how American democracy had collapsed long ago and that it was trying to work with allies and partners in these sort of little cliques, um, referring to you know countries like India uh, or Japan, uh, these huge economies as sort of you know insignificant members or not not very important. And that America was drawing lines with sort of democratic values. And, and uh, uh, he even, um, you know, this was Zhao Lijian, um, you know, 
famous uh, wolf warrior uh, diplomat, um, but in feigning outrage that uh, this was a complete betrayal of democracy, he said, when, when he was talking about the gathering of the four foreign ministers of India, Australia, Japan, uh, in the United States, in Australia uh, last week. And it seems to me, not only is that not a complete betrayal of democracy, just the opposite. It's four democracies trying to actually figure out how can they deliver public goods for the region. Um, whether they deliver them well or not is another matter, but it's certainly a, a valiant effort um, to try to do that. <clears throat> and democratic governance has to exercise really the civic duty to understand the different points of view, why China says these things, why China has a political apparatus that goes on the offensive, because this is where this line that uh, China doesn't export uh, its, its sort of ideology isn't quite the whole story, because their influence operations, their political warfare operations, um, definitely transcend the boundaries and the borders and the frontiers of China, and even the Sinosphere of uh, the diaspora. Um, and so you see that in this case, where they're literally out there attacking four democracies, trying to work on a positive agenda uh, for the region. I want to talk about so many other issues, uh, Humphrey, but I'm also uh, very conscious of the time. So let me turn it back to you. <laughs> that's, uh, that, that's very kind of you. There's so much there and so much to pick up on that I'm going to go to Martin Allen, who's asked you a straightforward question that you've been talking about democracy in Asia and the Western democracy's support for it. Martin says, Patrick, do you think democracy is strong in America today? Do, does America have the right platform to, to project democracy? Well, it's a weakened actor in terms of projecting democracy. There's no question about that. Uh, are we worried about democracy in America? Many of us are. I am worried about it. Um, but I'm also optimistic. Um, I think a lot of us in the in the COVID era have been reading a lot of American history. Uh, and no matter what period of American history I dip into, and I've been reading lots of biographies of every president uh, you know, back uh, to Washington, um, there's been huge upheaval. Uh, it's been a very messy business democracy. Um, a democracy is not, if you want, if you want the pristine sort of uh, presentation uh, of, of say the Chinese Olympics, um, that's not democracy. Uh, you're going to get something much, much more messy. Um, nonetheless, more seriously to this point, um, you know, what happened on January 6th was a watershed in recent American history, right? This was, you know, so I'm, we're worried about that. And we're worried about America's, um, you know, there, there are a number of issues uh, hindering American democracy and the ability for us to speak on these issues. But go ahead. So, so sorry, the, 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 the sort of democracy projection, and this came out in, in President Biden's first speeches about, about Asia, the Indo-Pacific, um, and they tried to get the D10 during the, 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 the summit last year, that sort of thing. Is it not on the wrong track completely? Because as we know from the countries, we're talking about 19 countries in South Asia and Southeast Asia, there is not one fully developed uh, democracy as in Japan or say South Korea or Taiwan. It is, it, it is in, in, you know, put in your own words, it is a mess of authoritarian, military, religious, whatever you want to call it. And Vietnam, which you mentioned, um, you know, has got closer bonds now with the US, well, that is, uh, you know, that is an old style Communist Party state, isn't it? So is democracy the wrong message to be taking out there or the right one? Well, democracy is not the main message to engage the Indo-Pacific. That's absolutely clear. But we're a global power uh, and we have our values. And, we're, we're it, and, it, and I think one of the lessons Hal Brands writes about this in the lessons of the Cold War, historian Hal Brands, that, you know, uh, human rights and democracy may be an imperfect uh, tool but it's an important one for influence for the United States globally. Now we're talking regionally about how well it's uh, working. And when you talked about the D10, the idea of getting 10 democracies together or more mm -hmm. to work on things like supply chain uh, sort of security or other technical standards and rules of the road, it's important for those democracies, those like-minded countries to stand up and help make the rules of the digital age. That's not inconsistent um, with wanting to work with Vietnam on its terms or work with other countries. It's a matter of the United States also, though, recognizing that there are international standards that have to be set. And I think, again, just final point on this was that, again, the Indo-Pacific strategy, if you just look at that 10-page document that just emerged out of the 10 pages of text, really, mm -hmm. um, out of the White House, uh, it, it does downplay it. It does have a paragraph up front talking about you know, civil society and free press, 
that's that's as part of the free and open Indo-Pacific aspiration. But when you get okay. down to the action plan, it it downplays uh, democracy promotion. Okay. And and before we move to Derek Grossman, a, a question really for for you, but but uh, Derek, my interest at the other panelists, mine is: Can we go back to uh, the days of the Monroe Doctrine, to the days when America was creating its own backyard and projecting power? And if you strip away the ideological element of it, how is is what China doing now different from what America was doing then? It's not that different, Humphrey. That's because the United States in the Monroe Doctrine period was emulating Europe and European powers. We desperately, as we as we rose in the 19th century and especially got to the Gilded Age of the latter decades of the 19th century, we were aspiring to be a European great power. Um, our power had risen to a, sim a similar level, but at the same time, uh, we were not yet accepted. And it wasn't until uh, Teddy Roosevelt and our military power, and it, that you know, we emerged uh, as sort of a, a paramount power. I, I see. That's it. And, and and Latin America and the Caribbean was then your equivalent to South Asia and Southeast Asia. It it wasn't equivalent to Southeast Asia in many ways, uh, as my friend Robert Kaplan has often written. But there are differences, and the United States evolved in those differences. And we now live in the 21st century when we actually aspire to hold up an international liberal rules-based order. That's the difference. That that international wow. order is still an aspiration. We don't know whether it can hold, but yeah. you know those, those the United States supports that system, and we want to see if it can work. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, St Martin Allen comes back and then he said, I was thinking more about the time of Reagan, I think that is, and his success, which is always in hindsight, and what success today. So that's sort of harping back. But let's let's bear that in, in mind. And we're going now to, to Derek Grossman, uh, and we're staying with Biden, The View from Washington, D.C. Derek is senior defense analyst at the Rand Corporation, which he joined after many years in the intelligence community. And he's going to focus on the shortcomings, some of the shortcomings of American policy in Southeast Asia, uh, that medley of countries that we've been discussing with no real shared ideology. Uh, Derek Grossman, give us your argument. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Humphrey, uh, and thank you to the Democracy Forum for hosting me today. Uh, it's kind of early here in uh, Southern California, uh, but I'm very glad to be with you. Uh, and so what I would like to do is pick up on my colleague Patrick's discussion on the recent uh, release of the Biden administration's Indo-Pacific strategy and talk uh, kind of specifically about um, not only the strategy, but also um, how the Biden administration has fared uh, over the last year in change uh, in Southeast Asia. I have an article that I that I wrote uh, for Foreign Policy back in December that kind of gives a scorecard uh, of what I what I see are some of the accomplishments and some of the things that still need to be done in the region by the Biden administration, keeping in mind that we're only about a year in, so there's still time uh, to right some of the uh, some of the uh, the the you know the uh, problems that uh, that remain in the region uh, for U.S. policy going forward. So let me begin with some of the positive aspects of uh, of the Biden administration's policy. I mean, I think the first uh, is that you know. In Asia, and specifically in Southeast Asia, showing up is more than half the battle. And I think the Biden administration has done a pretty good job of that. Uh, we had Vice President Kamala Harris visit Vietnam. Uh, she became the first sitting vice president to do so. Uh, we had uh, the Secretary of State, uh, Antony Blinken, visit Indonesia. Uh, and unfortunately, his trip got cut short. Uh, I think he, he was in Malaysia and Indonesia, but then his trip got cut short by COVID. Uh, he was supposed to also go to Thailand, but nonetheless, he also made it to the region. And we had the Secretary of Defense, uh, Lloyd Austin, visit uh, Singapore, the Philippines, and Vietnam. Uh, and we and it's important to mention we had the Deputy Secretary of State, Wendy Sherman, uh, visit Thailand, Cambodia, uh, in Indonesia. So, you know, senior officials in the Biden administration have made the rounds. And it's also in a COVID environment, it's also there have also been numerous virtual meetings. Uh, President Biden himself uh, was on uh, uh, the U.S. ASEAN uh, virtual call. Uh, and Secretary Blinken has also uh, tuned in to ASEAN foreign minister meetings virtually. So that's all really good stuff. And of course, 
we've heard that there's going to be most likely a U.S. ASEAN uh, leadership summit at the White House uh, next month. It was originally scheduled for January and it got pushed back, but it looks like it is going to happen in March. So all of that is really good to have that type of interaction. Uh, another positive aspect, and you know, again, picking up on what my colleague Patrick was talking about with the Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, so now we have a strategy on the books, all right. And you know, a lot of uh, folks in Asia will say, "Okay, great, you're saying all of these things that we want to hear, but where is it in writing? Uh, where is it officially kind of codified? Otherwise, it's just you're just talking, right?" And so having that on the books. I think is a really uh, positive thing. And, and we're all still reading through it and trying to understand it because it was just released on Friday. But my initial impression, and I agree with Patrick, is that it is a continuation uh, in many ways. I mean, the general sort of thrust of it is a, is a continuation of the Trump administration's uh, policies, uh, which you know seeks to counter China, uh, not only in the region, but globally. Uh, and it also seeks to deepen alliances and partnerships. Uh, but there's a lot more, I would say that uh, contrary to the Trump administration's Indo-Pacific strategy report, I mean, the Biden administration seems to put a lot more meat on the bones uh, in terms of you know, how they're going to seek to implement that strategy. Uh, and so it'll be very interesting to see how that, go how that goes uh, in the you know, coming months and, and years. Um, Another key point of that strategy is that the Biden administration seeks to uphold a rules-based liberal international order. Uh, and that is, you know, music to the ears of, you know, many, if not most of the countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, and so that, it, you know, again, a net positive to hear that type of language coming out of the Biden administration. And also the Biden administration has sought to, you know, from its perspective, repair a lot of the damage that the Trump administration had done to alliances and partnerships throughout the Indo-Pacific. And so there is a very, very heavy emphasis on that uh, in the current strategy document under the Biden administration. And then when it comes to China, I mean, everybody's always you know, very interested in what is, what is, what is the United States going to do with China, uh, uh, you know, not just in the Indo-Pacific, but globally. Uh, the Biden administration's Indo-Pacific strategy report is interesting because it does not characterize China, whereas the Trump administration's strategy report did so, right? So the Trump administration characterized China as an adversary, as a rival, as a competitor, as a revisionist power, and even indirectly as an enemy, okay? The Biden administration doesn't take any... Um, uh, doesn't have any description of China in there uh, at, at all. Uh, and so it's kind of it leads one to wonder, I mean, could, you know, even though we are in this extreme competition, quote unquote, um, that, you know, President Biden has talked about against China, uh, you know, could there be the opportunity to maybe cooperate with China in certain respects in the Indo-Pacific um, and, and, you know, so, and actually Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman, when she visited China uh, last summer, uh, part of the way that she was able to even have, get that trip uh, to, you know, to actually do that trip was to kind of beg off a little bit on the extreme competition part. She, she talked about the need for guardrails uh, in the U.S.-China relationship. Uh, and, and to, you know, to ensure that things didn't spiral completely out of control. And so, again, from a Southeast Asian perspective, when you hear that, you know, we need guardrails, but we also need to compete uh, very vigorously against China, I would say that uh, most of the countries in the region, uh, and we can even extend this to South Asia as well, most of the countries in the region tend to appreciate that more nuanced approach, whereas the Trump administration was just saying, we're going to compete uh, you know, to the nth degree. And also, oh, by the way, the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, is the root of all evil. If you do a control find on the um, on the new Indo-Pacific strategy report, you won't find uh, any mention of the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP. So this is not, you know, so the Biden administration is making it clear that this is not about undermining the CCP regime. This is not about regime change in any way. And the Trump, but the Trump administration, you know, that was a lot less clear. All right. So it has been clarified 
that this is about countering China by leveraging allies and partners to do so, less so about, you know, doing anything harmful against uh, uh, the Chinese leadership itself. And I think um, another important aspect that we've seen <clears throat> um, in the in the new strategy is that it's not all about China. There's transnational issues at play uh, throughout the Indo-Pacific. Um, you know, uh, obviously they talk a lot about climate change as being important. Uh, so, you know, again, Southeast Asian countries and South Asia, Asian countries like to hear that it's don't just talk about China because we're facing lots of other challenges on a day-to-day -day basis. One that that's cropped up quite a bit is Myanmar, right? So obviously we had the coup there uh, in February of last year. Uh, and ASEAN has been out front with its five-point consensus to say that, you know, uh, they are not going to allow the top Mada, you know, which is the Burmese military junta that now runs Myanmar, uh, to have a seat at the table for ASEAN meetings. And that's really tough for Cambodia because as my colleague Patrick said, you know, Cambodia is the chair of ASEAN for this year. And uh, the prime minister of Cambodia, Hun Sen, went to Myanmar la uh, last month. Uh, and it looked like he was going to try to get the top Mada uh, to participate. Uh, but the other ASEAN uh, states in particular, the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore were very upset by that. Uh, and so, you know, Hun Sen has backed off. Uh, and the Biden administration has been very kind of forward leaning about uh, the need for uh, the democracy to, you know, to, to be restored in Myanmar. Uh, and so it's good. So just take a step back. It's good for everybody in the region to hear that it's not just China, 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 the way it was during the Trump administration, that there are other challenges that we need to be focused on. And then finally, one other good part, I think, about the Biden administration, we've already talked about this to some extent, is that there's been a kind of recalibration uh, in the talk about values. So obviously, the Biden administration uh, came in on a foreign policy premised on uh, democracy, human rights and freedom. And I, I obviously, you know, I, I think that's a good thing. I think uh, all of us on the call think that that's a good thing. Uh, this is the democracy forum after all. Um, but at the same time, we have to be realistic because, uh, you know, as the Biden administration's democracy summit in December demonstrated, only three out of 10 ASEAN countries were invited because only three were considered democracies. Uh, and even those three, you know, there's you, you, you could you could question. I mean, the Philippines is a, under Duterte at least has been an increasingly illiberal democracy. Uh, and so anyway, the kind of the recalibration of the language has, I think, been a, a net positive because it kind of allows for other countries uh, to engage uh, the administration and to and to help and to help the United States in competition against China. Uh, and, and so I think, you know, let me give you one example of recalibrating that language when the secretary of defense visited Singapore and gave a keynote speech at the Fullerton Dialogue. Uh, he talked about how the United States is still an imperfect union uh, and can learn from, you know, uh, can, can correct wrongs in its system. Uh, and that, you know, is an important thing, right? So in other words, we're not just lecturing to others about how great we are in the United States, right? We have our own problems. And then when Secretary Blinken the next day went to India, he said publicly that, conversations on values are actually a two-way street, not a one-way street, not the U.S. lecturing, but learning also from the Indians and from other countries that can help us improve our own democratic governance as well. So let me quickly turn to some of the bad things or some of the things that are sort of not dealt with yet in Southeast, South and Southeast Asia. One is, you know, we have a lot of so we have a new Indo-Pacific strategy, but this is the latest incarnation of previous strategies. And so I think, you know, whether it's the pivot slash rebalance under the Obama administration or it was the Trump administration's Indo-Pacific strategy, you know, what are, what is what is our kind of level of sustainability in the region as there are big questions about, you know, our our economy, our own democracy, our military power on the on the decline and China's is on the rise, right? So what what are we to kind of, you know, how are we going to implement the strategy going forward? 
one of the criticisms of the Trump administration is it's just a vision. It's just a concept. It's not an actual strategy. You're not making decisions about, you know, areas that you're going to beg off uh, uh, on in order to, you know, do better in the Indo-Pacific. It's there are not those types of decisions made in these strategy documents. So I think that the region has, you know, ju justifiably, you know, good reasons to, you know, to to wonder about the sustainability of the strategy. Another problem for the Biden administration is Biden himself has not picked up the phone yet to call a single Southeast Asian leader. In spite of being on, you know, the virtual call uh, and, you know, having the U supposedly having the U.S. ASEAN summit next month at the White House, he has not made time to reach out to the leaders in Southeast Asia. Uh, and, you know, that I think raises some question marks about, you know, whether the U.S. is serious in the region. Uh, you know, when it comes to South Asia, he's obviously met with uh, with Indian Prime Minister uh, Narendra Modi. Uh, so, you know, there's some synergy there, uh, but not so much in Southeast Asia. I think there's also some concerns about the Quad, the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue. Uh, that's the, you know, Australia, India, Japan, and the U.S. discussing uh, issues of common concern, mostly either, uh, mostly indirectly related to China, but some that are, that are not. Um, ASEAN wants to maintain an ASEAN consensus and doesn't want to see some of its members drift off to, to the Quad as dialogue partners or something like that. And they don't want to be eclipsed generally in the region uh, because they would feel like, you know, issues of concern may not be tackled by quad, by the Quad or the Quad may inadvertently kind of, you know, start more problems for them with China or otherwise. Uh, so that is, you know, another thing I think that's worrisome. And AUKUS, I think we can put into that category, the Australia, US, UK agreement on the nuclear powered submarines, which also has lots of other defense and military aspects to it. This is kind of like everyone working together against China, and it's a further militarization of a region that, frankly, Southeast Asia does not want. want it does not want to see that for the most part, uh, and so there's big question marks about where that's going to go in the future. Um, and then two final points: one is the Biden administration unfortunately hasn't had many ambassadors that have been confirmed to the region. We do have uh, one in Singapore as of late last year, and now. Uh, within the last uh, week, we have one now in in Vietnam, but otherwise we don't have any confirmed ambassadors. And you can, you know, you can blame Congress for that and its slow process in terms of confirmations. Uh, but also, I mean, I think the Biden administration bears some uh, some of the blame. I mean, for example, they only just just in the last couple of weeks nominated someone for the Philippines. I mean, why is it taking so slow to nominate ambassadors? Right? Because again, showing up is more than half the battle in Southeast Asia and in South Asia. And if you don't ha if you don't have ambassadors on the ground, it's very difficult to do business. Uh, and then finally, uh, on on the on business, uh, there is no trade policy uh, for the United States in Southeast Asia. I mean, we pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement under the Trump administration, but we have not uh, been, uh, ha uh, sought to regain entry into what is now the CPTPP, the Comprehensive and Progressive uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, okay? Uh, and that's a problem. I mean, China has actually put forward an application to join the CPTPP. Taiwan has put forward an application to join the CPTPP. Where are we on that? And I think domestically, po politically, uh, it's kind of a non-starter in Congress. I don't think we can get it through. Uh, and I think Biden knows that. And so what do we do uh, since the Trump administration pulled out of that? What do we do to replace it? We have talked about an economic framework, uh, but with few details on what that means. It was actually mentioned in the strategy that was released last Friday. So we'll have to see. But what it sounds like is it means kind of aligning uh, best you know, practices uh, 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 in industry and commerce uh, with the region uh, and investing in things like digital economy uh, or di digital innovation, I mean, uh, finding ways to work together on climate change that can boost the economies of everyone in the region plus our own. Uh, but, you know, is that enough to counter what China is doing, whether it's through the Belt and Road Initiative or with China's partic participation in the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership or RCEP, which now along with ASEAN and Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, and Japan, uh, takes up about a third of global GDP in that trade group. So, And we're on the outside. The United States is on the outside looking in. 
So what is our plan to engage economically in the region? I don't think we have one at this point, at least not one that's been publicized. So we're all waiting to hear on that. Thank you. Derek, thank you for that. You did ask a lot of questions. So I'm going to throw one back to you. How long would it or, or how long would it take? How does the president schedule, say, 10 phone calls to the 10 ASEAN members? Or could he not just do one phone call to, or what would happen politically if he did one phone call to Hun Sen, who is currently the chairman? Why doesn't it happen? Yeah, I mean, I well, look, I, COVID kind of throws a wrench into everything, right? I mean, what what would have been in person is is now virtual, right? Yeah, but he, he can, as you say, pick up the phone. So, but he but he hasn't though, which yeah. I think is which is very which is very sort of telling you know i mean yes there's a lot of other problems obviously going on with the united states that need you know that that the us needs to focus on right now but i mean look what happened in terms of in, the first invitations to the white house for foreign dignitaries foreign leaders was to japan so we had uh prime minister then prime minister uh, suga visit the white house and yeah. then the month the month after we had president moon jae in from south korea visit right so yeah. They visited in person, but yet Biden has not picked up the phone even to call a Southeast Asian leader. So yeah. I think so, that's so there a is a, because because Southeast Asian, so sort of more so than South Asia in a way, is that sort of uh, you know ground where it could be a break on China's expansion, or it could be a channel for China's expansion, and that's where actually a lot of it might be played out as it has been played out in the in the previous Cold War that we know very well. That, that happened. Uh, thank you very much for that. I just wanted to, before we go on to Felix Hajduk, just to clarify that a year ago we were dealing with, or we the public were told we were dealing with a one-party Marxist-Leninist state. That language is gone. We were also told as Biden came in that we were pushing democracy into this region. That's been diminished. Is that right? So the language is getting calmer on all sides of that spectrum. Is that correct? I would agree with that. I think, yeah, there is a certain pragmatism that's coming into play. Uh, and Vietnam is kind of the model of that, as uh, Patrick yeah. very accurately explained. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that. Um, there's some questions coming in, so do wait around. But we're going now to Europe. We're going to Felix Heiduck, Senior Associate of the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. We're getting a European view. Uh, and he's going to be talking about how Southeast Asians have actually responded to the Chinese engagements, what drives them to foster closer ties with the People's Republic of China, and would those ties then be naturally at the expense of the US and the West? Felix Hajduk, the screen is yours. Thank you, Humphrey, for having me. It's a pleasure to, uh, to share my thoughts on this. Um, so basically, I would like to start with a little bit of a critique, so to say, from uh, on the overall view or perspective um, that this is basically, if we talk about the battle for influence, this is basically a battle between the US and China for influence in South Asia, South Asia or Southeast Asia. This is the region I mostly work on. So my critique is that this conceives of what is going on in Southeast Asia and other parts of the region. Basically, it's basically perceived that through a binary lens. There's like basically pitting China and the US uh, against each other, a battle for influence. And will we basically move from Pax Americana, which wasn't all that peaceful at times, to a new Pax Sinica, yeah? So basically a new Cold War, a quest over hegemony, it's Washington versus Beijing. So why the why would I cr criticize that? Because I would I would make at least two points here to to back my criticism up. One, if we take a more bottom up view, um, the U.S. and also European fo foreign policymakers, the West, whatever you call it, still signaling that we're sort of better aligned with Southeast Asian aspirations than China is. Uh, we promote freedom, openness, democracy, yes, in a more pragmatic manner, but we also balance against China uh, indirectly or uh, overtly, uh, increasingly. So I, I was wondering, are these the right buzzwords to open doors in the region? And I have my doubts. Why? Because I fear, especially in a COVID or post-COVID era, that a Southeast Asian 
elites, but also the general populations are less and less interested in talk of freedom, openness, and also in talk of balancing China, uh, and more and more about the material needs of the region and its recovery from the devastating impacts of the coronavirus pandemic. So many then argue, okay, this opens up all sorts of doors for China, and China will use this to make inroads, to increase its influence, to even some say to export its de developmental model um, to Southeast Asia. But when you actually look at um, uh, how in Southeast Asia, uh, local and national actors deal with this growing Chinese influence, we'll find that if we look at like, and there are a lot of case studies now on the Philippines. There was a Carnegie report on the Philippines a few months ago, on Myanmar, on Sri Lanka, uh, on Malaysia, on Laos, what have you. If if we if we look at the if the of the at the data there, the case studies and all sorts, it's often actually by work done by working through local actors and institutions adapting and assimilating often to local and traditional norms and practices. And it's actually often local or national elites in Southeast Asia that in the end determine how Chinese influence looks like, how it's practiced, et cetera, rather than the Chinese basically imposing their model, uh, their ideas, their practices onto the Southeast Asians. And at any point I would, and I would concur with Derek on this, many in Southeast Asia basically still hedge their bets, send mi mixed signals to the US and China, and also increasingly to other powers like Japan, South Korea, India, Europe, and what have you, um, and don't want to put basically all their eggs in one basket. Not, not the Washington basket, but also not the Beijing basket, basically. Uh, and the second point why I would critique this binary view of, of, of what we uh, see right now in Southeast Asia being essentially uh, uh, um, to be boiled down to a US-China rivalry is that Southeast Asia, I would say, is not uh, in a hegemonic era anymore. I would argue, and that's um, contrary to, to what Patrick said, that the liberal international order or US hegemony has crumbled uh, quite some time ago, if it ever fully existed. Yes, there are uh, attempts under the Biden administration to bring back U.S. hegemony to the region. There's a, very much a focus on hard military security, U.S. alliance, reviving or not reviving, re-strengthening the U.S. hub and spoke alliance system, uh, AUKUS, Quad, that was just mentioned. Um, but um, all of this basically uh, wrapped up in a, in a language that indirectly or directly aims at containing China, preserving US hegemony or, or leadership or you, whatever you want to call it. And this is basically what has made, made headlines here in Europe, at least uh, for the last month or, or even, even years, actually. But at the same time, and this is uh, very much picking up on um, Derek's last point, at the same time, if we look at Southeast Asia, Few in the region are fooled by the fact that the U.S. administration has to date no trade policy for the region. It's not part of RCEP. It has exited TPP, which is now rebranded as CPTPP. So there's, there's, there's really not very much coming forward from Washington there. It's leaving the door wide open for China and other actors. Um, and in the meantime, yes, China has pole vaulted uh, the U.S. and has become the biggest trade partner for all Southeast Asian countries. Um, so the hegemon, the U.S., so the former hegemon, has ceded much influence to China, but also to other partners, uh, to other actors, oh, sorry, Japan. Um, but it was also, uh, mind you, ASEAN who pushed hard for the completion of RCEP. It was Japan who revived the TPP as CPTPP. So I don't see much evidence that would suggest a return to U.S. hegemony anytime soon. So I think the liberal international order under U.S. leadership has crumbled effectively. Yet at the same time, I don't see China taking Washington's place. It does not simply have the soft power or hard power to push the U.S. out. So if we turn back to the original question of this of this panel, can China can China succeed? So. Some say China, yes, they don't just have the power yet, but the focus is on yet. And the period right now is just a short interregnum. 
So interregnum in the words of Antonio Gramsci, when the old order is dying and the new cannot be born. So there's a there's basically a crumbling established order, uh, but we are merely in an interregnum from Pax Americana to Pax Sinica. And I would argue, however, that this interregnum might be with us for quite some time. What do I mean by that? I mean that the battle for influence in South East Asia, but also in other parts of the region, will not necessarily lead to Pax Americana being replaced by Pax Sinica anytime soon, but that we might very well actually be entering a phase of multiplexity, as Amitav Achaya has, uh, has termed it, rather than uh, an era of new Chinese dominance or renewed US dominance. So can China succeed? Well, yes, it, it can, or maybe it has already in that US hegemony has effectively, in my view, crumbled in the region. So China, in a way, if you define success like that, has succeeded via forming bilateral relationships, via launching China-centered multilateral organizations like AIB, uh, via the Belt and Road Initiative, and so on and so, so forth. But again, first of all, this success is not all due ch to Chinese efforts. Um, for example, there are certain social forces, as Derek has alluded to at the end of his presentation, in US domestic politics, that are a major force factor when we try to explain why the US is so timid to put it mildly these days on, on free trade policies with, uh, with Asia. Uh, but the same can also be observed with regards to numerous BRI projects in Southeast Asian countries um, that have um, crumbled also or, or failed or not materialized due to certain social forces in these countries, um, um, essentially opposing them. So um, when we talk about can China succeed in achieving regional hegemony and replace the US as hegemon? I would say not so fast. I would rather, what I see is more of a multiplex order with neither the US slash the West nor China be able to run a region, dominate the region uh, on its own. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, very interesting. Just to clarify, when you say the, the crumbling of the international order, that's that's Southeast Asia and South Asia that that you're you're putting those together. The both of that, the international order is, uh, as seen from Washington, is on the decline there or has crumbled. Is that right? I would say so in many ways. Um, Probably not so much if we talk, for example, for Southeast Asia, if we talk about the security order or the security system, um, still the dominant factor there is, in my view, uh, the hub and spoke alliance system, the five alliances that the US still maintains in the region. Uh, China has not formed any, I would argue, alternative security order. Um, that has effectively replaced it or marginalized it or, or what have you. They do have their own ideas. I mean, Xi Jinping has, uh, since uh, 2014, repeatedly called for a regional security order by Asians, okay. for Asians, and so on and so forth. So the ideas are there, and you have the quasi-alliance with Pakistan, um, the intensification of relations with Iran, with Cambodia, and so on and so forth. So it's not for a lack of trying, I would argue, but still factually... If we talk about security policy, uh, I would say the hub and spoke system is, is still the dominant factor. However, I also mentioned, for example, trade policy. So has Derek. And I would say there you can see basically complete crumbling um, um, of, and, and of, of, the, of the U.S., uh, of the pivotal role the U.S. once had. And, and, and would you say that your view is a, a German government, no, not German government, a German view, a European view generally, because it is out of step with what we've been hearing from Washington? Is it a European, general European view that you're giving us? Well, I'm not definitely not speaking for all of Europe, but <laughs> me as a, as a, as a Berlin-based think tanker who mainly works on, on Southeast Asia, but for COVID reasons hasn't traveled very much as of late to the region, Yes, I would, I would, I would definitely argue it's probably more um, uh, 
a German, whatever that means, view than a Washington-based view. But then I'm also would never uh, dare to to speak for colleagues in Washington. So. Uh, add, 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 absolutely. I just wanted to, to get an idea because we have got these two distinct sort of power yeah. centers that we're doing. And and before before I let you go, Felix, uh, Rimjin Sud has a question. Uh, when it comes to certain countries' susceptibilities to Chinese wealth. Are policies too often geared toward Western solutions rather than being adapted to local realities? Well, yes, but I think, I mean, if you if you look at, I mean, the prime example is, in my view, is COVID in in a way, right? Where where you you can see, and I think this very much supports my argument that I that I made over the last 10, 15 minutes. I mean, you have you have the U.S. predominantly under Trump shunning global leadership, vaccine nationalism, and so on and so forth, Reject then widespread rejection of mask mandates and social distancing in the name of freedom, and so on and so forth. You have the Biden administration taking a, a slightly different approach, try to restore credibility abroad, but nonetheless, there was definitely no global leadership by the US, and there wasn't really much of a provision of public um, global goods by the US either, at least of, uh, throughout large large parts of the pandemic it was more like how to not actually manage the pandemic then so you had china would... on the other hand and yeah. just one sentence on this then you had china on the other hand very much trying to exert global leadership vaccine and mass diplomacy and so on and so forth but soon it became clear beijing first bungled up by trying to cover up the whole thing allowing yeah. the virus to take hold in china and then rapidly spread beyond its borders and then you bring in in china draconian zero COVID policies, you bring the virus under control, but at great cost and great cost, not so much to China, but great cost, especially to Southeast Asia, especially economically, right? So, so again, I see it's also very inward looking. So, so I think uh, in short, COVID-19 responses of Washington and Beijing makes neither the United States nor China appealing to many states in the region. That, that's interesting. So both China, both these two competing big powers were, were looking at their own solutions as opposed to the actual solutions on the ground, which is which is a very interesting point. And we're going to stay in Europe now and we're going to learn a little bit about these lacking or, or growing trade policies with uh, Michael Reiterer, a uh, former European ambassador to South Korea, now a distinguished professor at the Center for Security, Diplomacy and Strategy at the Brussels School of Government. Uh, in this big power conflict, uh, Europe remains a balancing force, but it's not always a unified one. Uh, Michael, I think, is going to be arguing the case of making Asian nations more resilient so they don't become caught up in great power competition. Michael, give us your thoughts. Well, <clears throat> thank, you, thank, thank you very much and a uh, warm welcome from, from Vienna. Well, when, when, when I had a look at the title of, of, two of our seminar, um, a battle for influence in South and Southeast Asia. Well, if you want to face up to that, I think then as a global player, and the European Union wants to be a global player, I think you have to be in the region, in the region conceptually and also on, on the ground. Now, let me introduce very briefly the, the conceptual papers, because it was I thought it was rather astonishing that in the last two years, you have seen the so-called strategic outlook uh, where um, the European Union has defined its uh, role with China. Um, this famous triptych, which has been adopted by many, I think, including the United States, partner, competitor, and systemic rival. So that is uh, an open definition, which is also meant to avoid the binary view um, on, on China and boiling everything down to, to this uh, US-China competition that would not be in the interest of the European Union and is not in the interest of, of the countries in the region we are, we are, we are talking about. Then there was the follow-up with uh, the so-called connectivity strategy between Asia and, and, and Europe, which was connectivity in a, in a wide sense, not only in terms of um, uh, physical infrastructure, but also people-to-people -people con contacts, um, uh, data, data flows, and so on. Then um, 
there was uh, the next paper, which was enhancing security cooperation in and with Asia, which was perhaps surprising to many that uh, Europe or the European Union was taking that up. But I think that links back to the 2016 um, um, uh, strategy paper of the Euro global strategy, where it was spelled out clearly that security of Europe and Asia is intertwined. And then uh, there was the Indo-Pacific strategy, this Indo-Pacific strategy um, earlier than the one of the United States. Uh, um, uh, and it was uh, produced in two steps, uh, a council conclusion as well as, as, as a working paper. And it could build on um, Indo-Pacific strategies of, of, of member states, especially France, which is the presence of the European Union in the Indo-Pacific, uh, because there are territories, there are 1.6 million uh, French uh, um, approximately li living there. And France has, I think, the second largest exclusive economic zone worldwide because of its presence in, in, in the Indo-Pacific. And it also has uh, military um, um, presence in, in the area. And then this was followed up, the Indo-Pacific strategy was followed up by the Global Gateway uh, at, the, at the end of, of last year, which, to make it uh, simple, enlarged uh, the Indo-Pacific further because the Indo-Pacific had only included East, Af East Africa, so it included now the whole world, but very much uh, having Africa in, in mind. That also brings us to one of the areas of competition in addition to Southeast Asia and South Asia, which we have, which we have discussed. Why are papers, policy papers important? Well, it was mentioned once uh, or, or already that uh, partners ask you, well, where is it written what you are telling me? But in the European Union, policy papers have an additional important function because they bring all 27 members on, on board. Foreign policy is one of the areas where you need consensus. So if you have a paper adopted and you have uh, these council conclusions on it, then you have a European uh, uh, view. If you add to that the ongoing work uh, on um, uh, the so-called strategic compass, which is a security concept uh, for Europe as a whole, uh, I think then you then, then you see that the European Union is trying to put its feet down in on in the areas which are important uh, for uh, the future. Of course, there is a, a, a huge challenge because the United States is to a certain degree withdrawing from from areas also in the near abroad of the European Union and as as partner and ally, the European Union will have to fill a void created by the United States in the near abroad, while at the same time trying uh, to uh, live up to its commitments and announcements, uh, which were made in the policy papers, which I have just uh, mentioned. Now, just uh, uh, on the area of, of, of uh, uh, working sur place, so, so to speak, on, on, on the ground, um, let me give you just uh, a few examples on uh, strengthening partnerships through sectoral cooperation. I will say a few words about multilateralism, which might not uh, surprise the Europeans, but perhaps our, 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 our American friends, and a few words about uh, security. Well, strengthening through sectoral cooperation, I think, has also, and that uh, links up to the last question here, uh, you have to choose the areas where there is mutual interest, interest in the European Union and with our partners. And keeping regional trade open, I think this is, this is, this is essential. Um, um, and I was worried and I have, I, have, I have shared a policy paper which I have written uh, re recently that we have now two regional trade agreements the RCP and the already mentioned CPTPP, where neither the European Union nor the United States is, is participating. Well, trade, uh, trade, uh, trade um, uh, agreements are not just about uh, uh, customs duties, moving them up and up and down and a few quotas, but they are very comprehensive nowadays. And they include one very strong element, which is rule making and standards setting. Uh, we like to talk about the Brussels uh, effect. 
So if you have these huge areas and you leave them um, uh, unattended, then there could be a development in standard and rule setting, which would be very detrimental um, also to the economic operators. And therefore, I'm a little bit concerned that this aspect is, is um, neglected. Um, um, the European Union has important free trade or economic partnerships agreements with uh, Korea and, and Japan, for instance, free trade agreements also with Singapore and, and Vietnam, and it is working on uh, with others, and also most importantly, has one in mind, a regional uh, with, with ASEAN, between the European Union and, and ASEAN. So I think this is an area which is extremely important, where I do agree the U.S. has, has left, or perhaps I should say Trump has left, but I also share the impression the Democrats are not too keen to jump back into, into, in, into these, these, these agreements. Uh, so this is an area where I would uh, argue strongly the European Union uh, should engage uh, even, even more in order to make sure that this vacuum is not filled in a way which is not in the in, in the in, in the interest. Geopolitics, of course, is also playing out when you have Taiwan and and China applying at the same time. That 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 creates some problems. But uh, have a have a, have a look at, at at my paper. I have I have explained that in quite some some details. Part of sectoral cooperation or functional cooperation, I think, would also be ocean governance. I think that there is also a lot of, of, of mutual interest. UNCLOS, uh, South China Sea, rule of law, uh, one, one, one area, but also um, building up um, ocean partnership. Uh, and I think this is an area where, for instance, China has, has engaged and is interested. So I think it is always important to find these areas and identify the areas where China can be brought on, 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 on board to avoid uh, the, 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 the impression that, that it is containment or to fall back into this binary uh, view, because that binder, binary view overall is weakening, uh, I think, the, the overall uh, uh, position. Uh, the same applies to re responsible supply chain chains in Asia, which is a project which is with, with China, Japan, the Philippines, Thailand, and, and, and Vietnam, um, uh, where, again, you have an area of common interest where you can have a cooperative approach. And I think this is, this is, uh, this is ex extremely uh, important. The same green transition, climate climate change, as well as uh, cyber security. I just mentioned the, the two so that we don't forget them. Uh, we, we could engage with them too. But these are typical areas of common interest. And I think that's, that's, that's important. Now, from the methodology, um, of course, multilateralism is, is close to the heart and the thinking of the European uh, Union. Um, um, and therefore, working with ASEAN and maintaining ASEAN centrality is, is important. And I think there is a certain competition out now uh, for ASEAN. The European Union will have later this year uh, also celebrating 45 years of, of, of dialogue. But we already have seen not so long ago uh, the, um, the um, uh, commemorative um, uh, summit with, with China. Well, it was, it was online, but uh, for the first time uh, the President Xi Jinping uh, participated. And what was also interesting that, and that was mentioned in relation to Myanmar, despite uh, China pushing for the inclusion uh, of, of Myanmar at the top level, that was resisted uh, by, uh, by, by ASEAN, I think, which is a good sign of, of, of showing a determination and a strength, uh, because what you need in the region, I think, is showing uh, determination, because otherwise you are bullied and you are, you are pushed uh, uh, around. Uh, the, uh, so working with ASEAN and make, making sure that ASEAN centrality is not only a word, but also a concept, I think is extremely important. There is one negative uh, example, which I think illustrates it very well. Originally, the RCEP was an ASEAN project, which was started in 2011 uh, in order to foster ASEAN centrality. 
and somehow it was hijacked by by China and very often RCP is presented as a Chinese uh, uh, project. So working with ASEAN and ASEAN centrality, there I must say the court does not augur well. There is no ASEAN centrality in 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 in, in court or in AUKUS, and by the way, there is also no. Uh, presence of, of the European Union. So if Quad has a positive agenda, uh, as it was mentioned, well, do good things uh, that uh, have more vaccines and all that, this is all fine. But if it were to become a, a sort of directorate of, of, of the Indo-Pacific, I think then I would have uh, very strong um, um, uh, reservations uh, against it. So ASEAN multilateralism. Another a multilateral uh, element which uh, uh, is due to the initiative of the European Union with ASEAN is the Asia-Europe meeting, ASEM, set up in 1996, and which has developed in a, a very comprehensive uh, dialogue uh, forum uh, uh, where uh, connectivity has been uh, a very strong element in, in, in the last uh, meetings. And it also has uh, the beauty uh, that this dialogue forum offers the possibility for, as it says, dialogue, free, free exchange, without the obligation to come up with, with, um, with uh, firm uh, commitments, which is very much the ASEAN way in talking in order to reach uh, consensus. One element I, I, I would, which is often for, forgotten, but which falls also under the multilateralism, this is uh, the Mekong and the Mekong um, uh, Commission. I think uh, there is there is a need uh, for more engagement, and uh, Secretary of State Blinken I think brought it very well to the point when he said, "Well, we also have to think about an open and free Mekong." Uh, I mean, if you if if if, if you look at the impact the Mekong has on agriculture, what the impact the Mekong has on the creation of energy, all the different dams and where they are built the, and where the energy is exported to. I think this is uh, an extremely important area which we should uh, not forget. Last point, uh, as I mentioned, is, is security. I think there the uh, European Union uh, is uh, showing that the, there is a need also to show um, military presence to a certain degree because it's more important, I would say, in the in the uh, to have the esteem, the evaluation, the recognition by Asian Asian partners. Otherwise, if it's only economics. Uh, then we have seen in the past a, a certain uh, well, you you are a second player. Uh, I I always thought that this is wrong. Economics, finance, climate change, environment, all that uh, soft power is extremely important. But um, the European Union, I think, engaged in the uh, in Atalanta in this anti-piracy operation, which was enlarged, rightly so enlarged, because the passage. Uh, um, uh, of the coast of Somalia is not only in the interest of the European Union, but also uh, of all the partners, because the trade between Asia and Europe goes through that area. Joint maneuvers with uh, with Japan, joint maneuvers with, with, with Korea, with Oman, I think brought an additional uh, element. The uh, increased European naval presence was announced in the Indo-Pacific strategy, which like the like like the one of the US is not anti Chinese labeled, um, but I think it's it's uh, there are possibility to fly the flags, uh, the flag on a boat or cross decking. You can exchange uh, soldiers from 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 dif different nations. And last one is Crimario, uh, which is uh, the possibility to extend patrolling from the south south uh, uh, China uh, South Asia to Southeast Asia. So I think this is uh, what I was trying to do is to give you a little bit of a package, um, which is sometimes uh, over overlooked from uh, what what Europeans are doing, but uh, the, the challenge is the thoughts are there, and now we have to implement, to implement, and to implement. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael. There uh, before I let you go, Prashant Kumar has a question. Given that you've 
nail down on trade and various networks. What impact might Chinese dominance in Southeast Asia have on India's Act East policy? Any thoughts or very quick thoughts well, actually on that? Well, uh, the, um, the European Union has, has picked up on that. There was a rather difficult relationship with India for some time, but now the, the, uh, after the summits, there is uh, agreement to restart ne negotiations on, 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 on a free trade agreement, on an investment agreement, and to do more on the Indo-Pacific. Indo so I think if, if uh, the, uh, a closer cooperation between the European Union and India in that area would also make it easier for India uh, to be, be a more active uh, player because it would not be put automatically into an anti-Chinese uh, uh, corner. Gotcha. And thank you. And just before I, I'm going, we're going back to Washington, D.C. now with Robert Sutter. So I just want to nail this down in my mind, everybody's mind, is that, is that you are with your colleague Felix on this, is that it, is that it's, it should be less binary and there's more of this idea of the crumbling international order and a reorganization of individual nation states. Is that right? Right. I mean, I personally, I always say uh, the I would prefer a new expression, uh, a co cooperative international order. Uh, I think that because the liberal is sometimes misunderstood and is creating unnecessary tensions. So a collaborative international order, I think, would put the focus rightly and uh, given the challenges which are before us and which I've mentioned, the collaborative element is extremely important. Okay, so that's a, that's a, a collaborate collegiate international order, which is very different from the competitive rivalry that we're hearing from Washington, where we're going back now to Robert Sutter, the Elliot's from the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University, a specialist in China's international relations it's, and the implications of its expansion. Uh, and in previous incarnations, Robert was in government, including a role as National Intelligence Officer for East Asia. Robert, you've heard the view from Europe and your colleagues in Washington. Give us your insights. Well, thanks very much. I really appreciate being part of this group. Um, uh, in my government experience, I was paid to be brief and to be focused, uh, and so I'm going to do both, I hope, today uh, and add to our discussion because uh, I think what we need more of here is uh, charting China's success uh, in looking at the, at the region. Uh, it's a very big topic we're dealing with, uh, and so uh, briefly on South Asia, I think, uh, and I spent a lot of time tracking China's uh, growth and influence in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, in South Asia, China is making advances in many ways, but uh, faces India. And the way they have handled India has not worked to their advantage. And uh, so I'm not too worried about Chinese uh, big expansion in South Asia because of India and uh, India joining the Quad with the United States and so forth. As you'll see, I view the dynamic between China and the United States as competition. And this binary approach that we're talking about that we think is not a good idea, unfortunately, I think the Chinese government thinks about it this way, just like the Trump administration did, and I think as the Biden administration does to, some, to a considerable degree. And so this is a reality that we're dealing with, and I think from China's point of view, this is very important. And where I see the Chinese making gains is in Southeast Asia. And I want to focus my remarks on that because China's success in spreading influence here in Southeast Asia represents the area of most significant advance in Chinese influence countering the United States in the Asia Pacific in the past decade. Uh, so we need to watch this. And what we'll see, and I'm going to focus on the last year, what China's been doing, because they've seen the Biden government as a bit more formidable uh, than the Trump government, not uh, episodic in dealing with the region, but much more systematic. Uh, and they've been very active in dealing with this. And on balance, what they show are China's strengths. We've already talked about the U.S. government's weaknesses. I, Derek did a great job, and, uh, and others have talked about these different elements that are that are weak in the United States uh, perspective in dealing with Southeast Asia. Uh, and in that context, what you see is China preparing and then executing policies that just in contrast to what the U.S. is doing, make them look very strong. And I think it reflects their strength. And I'm going to try to talk about 
the influence that China has on these uh, particular countries. The second point I want to make, in addition to the success the Chinese have had in Southeast Asia, is that over the past year, Chinese officials and media have devoted more attention to Southeast Asia than to any other foreign topic except for relations with the United States. So they think this is very important. You see Xi Jinping very actively involved in this area. Uh, you see the foreign minister is all over the place in dealing with this area, so different than the United States and its COVID restrictions. So what are some examples of this? The first example has already been referred to and how the Chinese take advantage, took advantage of Mr. Trump's absence in the uh, Asian meetings at the end of uh, 2020 uh, to highlight the, the recept as uh, something that China very much wants and implicitly leads uh, this trade organ organization, which of course the US is, is not a member of. And then the week after, uh, at the same time, Mr. Xi Jinping takes the initiative in the APEC meeting to show that uh, they're going to try to join the CPP, TPP. Again, underlining the, the weakness of the United States and the advances that China is pursuing in, pursu in, in its interest in building its relationship with Southeast Asia. Uh, Wang Yi, the foreign minister, visited nine, in person, visited nine Southeast Asian countries from October 20, uh, 2020 to January 2021. And then he held in-person meetings in China in April with four regional foreign ministers. Very active here. Sen Secretary Blinken had his first video conference with ASEAN in May, and it didn't work for technical reasons. That was contrasted with Wang Yi had a retreat for, for ASEAN foreign ministers for two days in person in China. This is advancing. Now, what's behind this? What's the substance? The substance is, China ASEAN trade is booming. It's 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 enormous. Uh, it's Ch ASEAN's China's leading trading partner. It grew by 20 20 percent last year, and it grew a lot in the previous year. And Chinese infrastructure and investment is growing handsomely. China is, was and is the leading source of medical supplies and vaccines in Southeast Asia. Uh, China, uh, did we mentioned the Mekong. China's control of headwaters, of rivers important to Southeast Asian development, they provide a unique leverage on downriver countries. And, and it's, it's a fact. Uh, it's a, China has sustained good relations with the Myanmar, with the Myanmar Junta and, and ASEAN, putting Beijing in a much better position than the United States to deal with this crisis. And China's military, Coast Guard, and maritime militia ably control and defend China's enormous claim in most of the South China Sea against weak Southeast Asian claimants. Meanwhile, Beijing's less overt but common means of influence advantaging China also showed no let up. Uh, 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 Professor Great and Great, our first speaker, underlined this point on the use of national, secu national uh, uh, public security apparatus in improving relations with Southeast Asia. But other efforts include the following. Efforts to influence the Chinese diasporas in Southeast Asia. Leveraging Chinese provided transportation, communication, and other infrastructure to compel recipients' deference to Chinese requirements. Routinely accommodating corrupt regional leaders in economic agreements, winning their support. Fostering China's state penetration of local media, gaining positive publicity. And using the flow of Chinese tourists as an, uh, an area of leverage. Against this background, ladies and gentlemen, what you see is this. ASEAN and most Southeast Asian states remain publicly silent in the face of Chinese expansionism in the South China Sea. A broader pattern is that uh, Southeast Asian governments avoid criticism of China on a wide variety of issues. And these issues keep, keep broadening uh, in order to avoid punishment from Beijing. In contrast, these Southeast Asian fish, officials are quite fr frank in criticizing U.S. policies uh, and practices. Okay, so capping this kind of situation is November of this past year where Xi Jinping hosts a summit uh, to commemorate the 30th anniversary of the ASEAN-China dialogue. And this again marks major advances. Let's take a look at some of the particulars here. 
Well, they upgrade the relationship between China and ASEAN to a, a comprehensive strategic partnership. Uh, they upgrade the free trade agreement between China and ASEAN. Remember, ASEAN is now China's leading trade partner. Uh, China says it will donate 150 million doses of COVID vaccine to ASEAN members, and it pledged an additional $1.5 billion in development systems to them over the next three years. And supporting this is, are these following facts. At this time, in, the, in November of 2021, uh, China had provided ASEAN with 360 million doses of COVID. At that point, the U.S. had provided six, 60 million doses of COVID. U.S. doses are better than the Chinese dis, di, doses, but 360 versus 60 is significant. China ASEAN trade reached 684 billion in value in 2020, and it reached 703 billion in the first 10 months of 2021. By, by contrast, U.S. ASEAN trade in 2020 was $308 billion. Now, there are instances when some leaders in, in Southeast Asia will complain about China. And Mr. Duterte did this at the summit about the South China Sea hard po policies of China. And what did Xi Jinping do? He ignored him. And he went on to say things like this. He says, we never bully small countries. This shows mendacity, perhaps, but it shows a confidence that he has this under control. And if you look at the hard tactics that they're taking in the South China Sea, what do you see? You see no let up. You see them ever more coercing the Philippines. Uh, now, uh, Indonesia has been warned against uh, oil exploration and Chinese ships uh, make shows of force there and surveys uh, are conducted to uh, uh, to underline their position. Uh, and Malaysia is, uh, again, faces these uh, face-offs with Chinese coast harassment by Chinese Coast Guard forces and others as they try to carry out uh, surveys for their energy uh, involvement. So what's the outlook of this situation? Well, you've seen that the Biden government uh, is, uh, that, well, first on the Chinese side, going forward, the Chinese have a strategy, hard and soft tactics, and it works very well ever increasing their influence, ever increasing the things that the Southeast Asian won't do, the Southeast Asian governments won't do, that would be offensive to China, and, uh, and uh, making it very hard for the U.S. to compete. The Chinese, when the U.S. does something, the Chinese do things that overshadow the U.S., just as uh, Xi Jinping's uh, summit uh, meeting with the ASEAN leaders in November showed. Uh, on the other hand, you have the U.S., and the U.S., Mr. Biden is leading a democracy trying to change its fundamental policy in Asia from one of engagement with China to one of competition with China. And this has been going on for over five years, and it's very awkward. And Mr. Trump was not very effective in doing this. He pointed to the need for it, but he didn't do it very well. And the U.S. position in Southeast Asia declined significantly during the Trump government. Mr. Biden has yet to figure out the strategy toward uh, China. Uh, he's, he has a lot of complications yet to be worked out, uh, and the economic complications have been discussed already. So it's, and he's trying to reassure the countries in Asia that his approach, which is not the selfish, inward-looking American first policy, is going to be sustained. And yet Mr. Trump looms very large as a possible winner in the 2024 presidential camp, uh, election campaign. And so we have a big problem for Mr. Biden as he goes forward. For now, he's going forward in areas that will not be sensitive to the countries in Southeast Asia. So he won't move forward much with uh, military relations with Vietnam. Uh, and others uh, that he wants to move forward with, uh, it'll be very limited because they don't want to do things that will be very offensive to China. And so, but there's plenty of areas still to improve relations. But how active he will be? Look at his priorities. And why hasn't he called these people? Look at his priorities. He has a whole list of them domestically. And, uh, and we've been touch and go with legislation on all sorts of issues over the past year uh, in Congress. He's been on the phone with Congress a hell of a lot more than he's been with foreign leaders. And now we have the Ukraine crisis. So 
So he's busy. And, uh, and so where Southeast Asia fits in this, I think is not that high, particularly if they're not prepared to respond. If they're not prepared to say, you do that and we'll do something for you. The Quad is very different. The Quad is willing to do that. They have a very different view of this. Southeast Asia doesn't. So it, it's against that background that I think the Chinese are pretty confident of how they're doing. I think the, the outlook is good for them. They can maneuver in various ways, use coercion, use uh, positive incentives, and have their way in areas that are important to them. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, can I take a question that we've got in from Ajay Pradap Singh Rator and rephrase it for your own? Is China could face problems if not insensitive in assessing the social and ethnic dynamics of these regions? But what you're sort of saying there is that it's actually China is showing up more, to put that phrase, far more than the U.S. is. So is it the U.S. that's facing problems because it's not sensitive? Gee, I don't know. I don't think the Chinese worry about sensitivity so much. They're working with the leaders. They're working with the government. They're working with the people who decide. Uh, that's the more important uh, arena. Uh, Sure, they, they try their somewhat to appeal to uh, public opinion and things like that. But uh, I think their control efforts are much more focused on controlling the senior leaders of, the, of different countries. Right. So, uh, so who's more sensitive to that? Well, does it matter in this kind of power dynamic that we're seeing right now? How much does that matter? And I immediately, I'm not sure it matters that much. And, uh, and but what I, what I do see is that China is winning that competition in Southeast Asia. Right. I think I think that was uh, the, the one. And, and I just wanted to, to, to mention before we go to, to Barry Gardner, uh, you talked about South Asia as, as not being such a sort of focal point. But is it not the case that Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Nepal, sure. uh, all these places are, 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 are a focus of China's attention? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, they're working on it. But India, they really fouled up the relationship with India. And OK. And uh, and India is a heck of a lot more important than any of those other places. And so I, I think in South Asia. So I so as a region, I don't see India falling under China's sway because India is there. Uh, right. But in Southeast Asia, there's nothing like that. And yeah. so uh, uh, and I think it's it, 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 they're weak. And, yeah. uh, and and the result is that China is ever more uh, expanding into Southeast Asia. It's influence into Southeast and, Asia. And, and, and do you buy into the crumbling international order or are you, are you with your colleagues in Washington on the, on the binary uh, superpower play? I, I think if you look at Washington, if you look at the Congress and so forth and their concern about China, what they're trying to do is defend America. I think they're very worried about being dominated by an order that China would lead. Uh, and this is uh, both in the security point of view in Asia, this type of thing, but it's economically. And they worry about China dominating the high technology industries of the future that will define economic power in the future and will define military power in the future. And so, so unless we get that, unless we get that right, uh, then, uh, then we're gonna be, the, the, there's a sense of acute vulnerability to dominance with China and that's, so it's it's quite intense in that sense. Yeah. yeah, got it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Robert. Now, listening uh, throughout all this has been the Democracy for Chair, Barry Gardner, Member of Parliament, vastly experienced through his political career in this region and its issues. So, Barry, sum up for us, please. Humphrey, thank you so much. Summing up is going to be very difficult uh, because uh, we've had so many views, I won't say in, in contradiction to each other, but certainly in tension with each other. Um, I thought it was really interesting to get Sheena Greiton starting off uh, focusing on uh, security, police training. Um, how is democracy presented, she said? Is this a choice? Uh, China's growing use of law enforcement and policing domestic security uh, as a means of reaching out to other countries in the region uh, and establishing its way of doing things. So China, I, I think she talked about it as uh, sharing how they have developed a secure country in China. Um, a very interesting take on it. Um, but she said that it was driven by a focus on counterterrorism 
and anti-corruption. Well, in and of themselves, those things uh, should be welcome to us. We, of course, want to see uh, security and policing uh, driven by counter-terrorism uh, and anti-corruption. Uh, the question is, who is the terrorist? Um, and there, the, the whole issue of China's relationship with the Uyghurs comes into play um, regarding uh, people as, as terrorists who are not and suspect who are not. Um, also, this interesting feature of geography being no barrier to the long arm of Chinese law enforcement. Um, and of course, in the UK, we've seen that with Russia, with the Salisbury poisoning, um, and, and the way in which uh, countries who don't respect uh, the democratic rights that we take for granted, uh, as having uh, seeing themselves as being able to reach with impunity into other states uh, and carry out acts of, of terror against civilians there. Um, of course, it's right to point out that uh, in the region, Sri Lanka's police are being trained by the Scottish police. Um, and Humphrey, you said, well, how is this different to our UK policing and security sector training? Um, and the response came back, well, implicit, and this, I, I think I, I quote Sheena correctly here. She said that, well, implicit in what we do is human rights and governance and civil liberties. Well, I, I wonder, um, whether it should not be explicit in what we do. Um, and certainly when we're looking at the way in which our police force is engaging with Sri Lanka, um, we have uh, not been able to enforce the UNHCR, the, 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 the UN, um, sorry, the human, UN Human Rights Commission's uh, call uh, for uh, justice and, and a proper investigation there of the war crimes. Um, so interesting take, though, to, to look at this from that security perspective. Patrick Cronin um, talked about Biden's strategy, and, and that was, I thought, really helpful to lay that out, to get that as a basis for our, our discussion. Uh, the battle for influence, a global struggle. Uh, he talked of China wanting to become the most influential global power, uh, and of course then talked about the way in which the US was uh, and the Quad were now moving to, to form a multilateral pushback against China. Um, and I think he said, if we don't stand for freedom as it is today, um, then I, I think he left that hanging. Um, but his focus was very much on freedom. And he talked about democracy and human rights being downplayed by the Biden document, the, the strategy document. Uh, I thought that was very interesting. Um, and I wonder how we can simply focus on freedom and not see that within the context, the wider context uh, of democracy and human rights. Um, he highlighted uh, the way in which Duterte had, had spoken about the needs of poverty being addressed, inequality needing to be addressed. Uh, and again, freedom for some, of course, uh, it, it leads to levels of poverty and inequality for others very often. Uh, and holding these two in tension is what I take democracy to be all about. It's not just about one of these core values. It's about the way in which we bring all of them uh, into tension uh, but a constructive tension that can, can be sustained. Um, Martin Allen, I thought, posed a, a, an interesting question at this point. Um, is democracy strong in the US today? He, he asked. Uh, and of course, anybody who was watching uh, CNN as, uh, uh, as I was over the past uh, few days uh, will have noticed the way in which um, AOC's remarks have, have been uh, taken up by CNN in a series of interviews um, as to whether democracy in the, the US is going to still be there in, in, in 10 years time. Um, so there's a real concern about what democracy means and it cannot simply be boiled down to the word freedom, I think. Um, and of course, really, um, 
the worry about democracy, which Patrick Cronin acknowledged, he said, yes, there is a worry about democracy in answer to that question from Martin Allen. Um, but I think we have to say that every democracy is only as strong as our desire, each generation's desire to protect it. Um, and I think he also said democracy is not the main message to be taking out there to South and Southeast Asia. Um, because the meaning of democracy is contested. Um, he focused, as, as many uh, subsequent uh, speakers did, on the international rules-based order. And of course, it's a question of what are the rules? We'll, we'll come back to that. Derek Grossman, um, first of all, let me say how lovely it was watching the dawn in Southern California in, in the background through your window, Derek. Um, but you... you put a, a, a clear marker down when you said showing up is half the battle. Absolutely. Um, having a written strategy, yes, even better. Um, but you talked about um, countering China and deepening other alliances around a rules-based international order. This is picking up from, uh, from what Patrick was saying before. Um, and you seem to focus, where, where Patrick had focused on on freedom, where, where uh, Sheena had focused on, on uh, security. Y you spoke, I think, more about peaceful coexistence, um, China no longer being singled out by the Biden strategy as an adversary, as Trump had done, the need for guardrails in our vigorous competition, uh, Biden making it clear that it's not trying to undermine the CCP, um, and you also, I think, uh, very helpfully spoke about the way in which the role of ASEAN uh, and Myanmar not being allowed a seat at the top table uh, following the coup there. Um, you brought together those words, democracy, human rights, and freedom. Um, and you spoke about the learning that... Uh, each party, whether it's the US, or I would add whether it's the European Union, or whether it's the UK, now we're not in it any longer, uh, learning from each other. Um, the region you said was unsure about the sustainability of Biden's strategy, um, and that uh, you made the, the very powerful point that actually Biden hadn't made the call to so many of them, point picked up uh, uh, later on, of course, as well. Um, but you then went on to focus on, on the nuclear subs uh, and the, the way in which Southeast Asia doesn't actually want to see further militarization of the region. Um, and that deal that the UK has now struck with, with, with uh, Australia actually perhaps being an irritant uh, in, in the relationship. Um, and of course, critically, you highlighted the, the fact that the trade policy of the administration uh, with regard to Southeast Asia is pretty non-existent. Um, so I, I wanted to pick up one thing because um, I can't remember whether it was yourself or, or whether it was somebody else who mentioned UNCLOS, <coughs> but of course, um, the U.S. doesn't like the international rules-based order when it doesn't entirely suit them. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that, that the U.S. hasn't uh, ratified UNCLOS. <coughs> Excuse me. Even though, of course, it has accepted it as a codification of, of the customary in, in international law in that area. Um, I think, actually, it was Michael Reiter who... <coughs> who, who press that point home. Let me just take away my throat tickles. Um, Felix, you, your critique, <coughs> is this simply a battle for influence? I, I think you said no, you really saw the, the breakdown, the, the, the crumbling of the old binary order. Um, you said that there was a bottom-up view uh, that signals that we can be more aligned with Southeast Asia. And, and you, I think, very helpfully spoke about the role that each of these individual countries has in their own engagement with China uh, in modifying the way in which China then uh, can act and does act in the region. Um, 
You also pointed out, I, I, I think um, importantly, that people don't care about freedom and democracy as much as poverty and equality. I'm not sure those were entirely your words, but, but the sense of it <coughs> was that poverty, inequality were fundamental issues that had to be resolved um, before, in effect, the West had permission to talk about freedom and democracy uh, as we see it. Um, and I, I like the point that you made about uh, Southeast Asian countries interacting with China, influencing that relationship. Um, and you, you said that China had pull vaulted the US, obviously, as the, the lead trade partner. Um, and the international order under the US leadership, you said, had crumbled. Um, the interregnum between the Pax Americana and the Pax Sinica uh, may rumble on for some time. Um, uh, you said you don't think that uh, the progress is going to be that fast. Um, Humphrey, I think at that point you interjected to, to find out whether this was a European view um, because you said it was out of line with what we're hearing from Washington. Well, the, the Mandy Rice Davis's comment uh, about what we're hearing uh, from the American side would come into play there. Uh, you know, well, they would say that, wouldn't they? So I, I think we have to take into account that each is coming from their own perspective. And, and here, COVID, I think, again, and helpfully later as well with what uh, Michael Reiter was saying and, and, and Robert Sutter, um, the way in which the US has looked at intellectual property rights, uh, the UK indeed has looked at international property rights as being primary here in, in terms of COVID vaccinations and um, the problems China had with the cover up. Um, but really, I think Felix highlighted here the need of both the US and China uh, not uh, to dismiss or, or, or to actually begin to take account of the local powers and what their interests are, rather than seeing it only from their own perspective. Michael uh, Reiter, uh, looking from, from the EU again, uh, he talked about choose the area where there is mutual interest. Um, and of course, he spoke about the abrogation uh, from the RCP and the CPTPP, uh, again, no EU, EU involvement, uh, spoke about rule making and standard setting. Again, the issue of, of, of UNCLOS um, comes up. And I, I think we need to develop what he talked about in this collaborative, cooperative international order. But the question is collaborate on what? What are we, what are the, the, the values that we can collaborate on? Because in focusing on trade rightly, um, I think the trouble is that trade is not used as it could be to enhance social and human rights issues or indeed environmental standards. Um, so we talk about these things, but when it comes to trade, very often we leave them out of our trade policy and our trade negotiations. So you might ask, well, do, do some of the uh, South and Southeast Asian countries get the sense that the EU and the US are only interested in these things when they don't conflict with our economic interest? Um, I, I liked his, his concluding phrase, implement, implement, implement. Uh, finally, Professor Sutter, um, charting China's success in spreading influence in the region, and, and critically, I think, underlined the weakness of US policy um, and the way in which China would then undermine uh, or underline that weakness and undermine the US and in its own response. Uh, trade booming uh, as the US had withdrawn, um, medical supplies from China, um, $1.5 billion dollars uh, of development assistance promised. Uh, I think he, he said 150 million further. I think he actually said doses of COVID. <laughs> I think he meant doses of the vaccine, um, but also pointed out that previously um, the US had given 60 million uh, vaccine doses uh, against China's 360 million. Now, you can't fault China for doing that. This is engaging 
uh, with its neighbors in a way that means something to its neighbors. And I think it leaves us with a question about how do we um, go to, to what Michael Reiter was calling this collaborative, cooperative international order. Um, we have to be able to engage with the countries in Southeast Asia on its own, on their own terms, for their needs, in tackling poverty, in, in tackling COVID, uh, in making sure that the ways in which uh, we engage with them, both in trade and in economics, are actually um, in sync with the language that we are using about democracy and human rights uh, and equality. Uh, and I think what Robert highlighted was that at the moment, uh, we're failing in doing that. Uh, and that leaves a very big question for all of us. Humphrey, thanks very much. Barry, thank you very much. Well, could I take advantage of your unique position since Britain isn't part of the European Union and not part of the United States? Could you possibly just for a second put aside your, your domestic political allegiances and on this binary against a, a crumbling international order, where does, where does Britain stand? I, I think Britain, uh, the British government at the moment, stands in the binary camp. Uh, I, think, uh, I think our government views it very much as um, this is one hegemony giving, giving way to another, um, and we want to shore up the one that we are closest to uh, with the US. And <coughs> I think we've seen the Quad um, and the, the engagement with Australia and the nuclear submarines um, as, as a way of doing that. Um, and that's why I thought it was so interesting, actually, yeah. that there was that pushback at saying, look, maybe ASEAN countries don't want any further militarization of their region um, in that way. Um, so we need to be, I think, very careful. But fundamentally, we need to get the economics right. Economics will cut through a lot, but that economics has to go with an understanding of the needs of those countries in terms of poverty, inequality, and labor rights, which we, we very rarely talk about in trade, trade agreements. <laughs> you know, but, but, but child labor, slave labor, um, you know, modern slavery. These are things that we leave out of our, our, our trade negotiations yeah. as long as we feel we're getting a good deal. Uh, yeah. And I think there's a lot that we need to to bring in here and learn from what, what was referred to as the bottom up. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Barry Gardner, uh, the chair of Democracy Forum, summing up for us and taking a supplementary from me. Uh, next month, Democracy Forum debate is Wednesday, the 16th of March at two o'clock UK time. Uh, the India factor in US China rivalry, a Western perspective. Uh, please subscribe, read, talk about our sister magazine, Asian Affairs. Uh, and until next month, uh, thank you, Sheena, Sheena Gratins, Patrick Cronin, Derek Grossman, Felix Hajduk, Michael Reiterer, Robert Sutter, and Barry Gardner, and wow. Boone, Lord Charles Bruce. Thank you all for joining us and from all over the world, your comments and your questions, the team at Democracy Forum, and from me, Humphrey Hawksley. See you next month. Stay interested, stay involved, and stay safe.